Hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, week three of our course. And so this is just going to be a fairly short overview this week. Uh, we have a bunch of new activities that are in place. Uh, and what you'll kind of notice is between this week and next week, so week three and four, we're going to begin ramping up our uh, writing process a little bit more. And so um, in week three, I don't have a video lecture posted. In week four, I have uh, the lecture entitled uh, Reading and Writing Two Sides of the Same Coin, um, which I just heard from somebody in class uh, that the link isn't working. So I will work on that and get that fixed um, in the next day or so. But uh, this week, really, what we're doing is we're just reflecting on our experience as readers. And, and the reason this becomes so important is because we're given all kinds, we're sent all kinds of messages over the course of our academic lives about what it means to be a reader and who we are as readers and what we think about reading. And just to kind of preview the content from uh, reading and writing two sides of the same coin, in order to be a strong writer, we have to have a strong understanding about uh, what reading is, what print is, what text is, and what it can do. And I, I always use this story, and I, I'm not sure how helpful it is in framing it, but um, you know, you, you can reply in the discussion board if, if it's not helpful. <laughs> um, but you go to kindergarten and or first grade, and you begin the reading process. Now, my wife is a kindergarten teacher, and so I hear all about this all the time. And if you ever look at a, a line of kindergarten students, you see that you have some that you know are tall, some that are short, some that you know are really precocious and, and speak um, prolixically. <laughs> uh, you see all of these different iterations of what it means to be a kindergartner. And you know, from from a developmental standpoint, we also differ in the ways that we uh, develop cognitively and we're ready to read and we're ready for print, we're ready for text. In the same way that, you know, my, my oldest daughter um, walked when she was 14 months and my youngest daughter walked when she was nine months. And, and you know, their age wasn't the, the confounding factor. It was just their developmental readiness for that stage. The reason this becomes so important is because in the time where we're in school, we move through all these stages and depending on what the kind of arbitrary expectations are for the grade level that you're in, you may be told that you are good or bad at something based upon the developmental step that you're on. Right, so if you're going to assess, and I, I know that I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, I'm sure everybody is kind of aware of these things, but you know, if you're going to assess how well kids do at walking, at 12 months. My youngest daughter would be proficient. My oldest daughter would be deficient. But right now, they both walk and run and play sports and, and function just fine. So they, they both can do that skill that at that snapshot in time, they couldn't do. And the re reason this is important when we think about reading is because sometimes early in our academic careers, we're told that um, we're not good at reading or we're not good at math, or you know, we need extra support. They have this thing now in education, and if you're recently uh, graduated, called win time. It's, it's what I need now. And you're put in like you know, ability-based groups. But we begin to have beliefs about ourselves as learners based upon the groups that we associated with when we were younger. But just like my daughter who could, couldn't walk until she was 14 months, you know, those groups don't matter as much as we get older. So even though you've judged yourself in this way and maybe have conditioned yourself in this way, that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily continue to be your identity. And I think we allow for growth in a lot of other areas of our lives. But when we think about reading or when we think about math, when we think about academics. We have this sometimes we have this very fixed mindset. We have this this belief that um, that those old kind of categories that we were placed in still have relevance. So uh, what do we do with this? What I wanted to start thinking about is what is it 
Like, what is your experience as a reader? What works for you? What doesn't work for you? Um, you know, how do you read? And when do you typically uh, stumble if you do stumble when you read? Or what contexts are, uh, are good for you? So what I want you to do in uh, this unit, so there's, there's a few activities, right? So I want you to talk about your experience as a writer. I want you to watch the clip that I um, recommend in Reading Between the Lives. I think that video does a nice job, although the editing is horrible and I apologize for that. Um, I think it does a nice job of giving some of the things that we think about ourselves as readers sometimes. <clears throat> and then the activity here is called the metacognitive awareness activity. And what that is, is you're going to read the article, um, who are you and what are you doing here? And it's long, right? It's a longer kind of pseudo academic article. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not gonna say much about it right now. I'll comment about it again next week. But um, while you're reading it, I want you to commit to doing one of two things. And this is what the assignment is for the week. I want you to read a paragraph and at the conclusion of each paragraph, I want you to either on one side of the page, if you decide to print it, or on an Excel spreadsheet, um, if you decide to read it online. Uh, I want for each paragraph to either write what you think, so you make a connection, um, you um, provide an example, you write interesting, you uh, talk about a, something that you've done, write one or two words, nothing, nothing uh, over the top. Or, for each paragraph, right? So you're gonna do one or the other, or for each paragraph, you're gonna write what you feel. <clears throat> so for instance, I'm gonna um, share my screen and I'll show you what I mean here. All right, so this is the article that I'm asking you to read. And so for each paragraph, you're gonna write something, right? And so um, if you're doing this, like I said, if you print this and are doing it on paper, you can write on one side of the page or the other. Um, if you're using the Excel spreadsheet, Right, you can uh, you can just type it on here. So I'm going to split my screen just so you can see what I mean. And so this is what I would recommend. And so the the activity takes a bit of time, right? And so for instance, I'm going to look. Welcome, congratulations, getting your first day of college is a major achievement. You're to be commended, not just uh, you, but the parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts who helped you get here. Okay, so that's fine, right? Um, so I might say, yes, Oops. might say yes, lots of help, it takes a village. It's been said that uh, raising a child effectively takes a village. All right, so we already said that. I agree with this paragraph. As you notice, our American village is not in very good shape. We've got guns, drugs, two wars, fanatical religions. So this is old. And I'm going to write that. Old article? Question mark? Single perspective? Right, and so I'm going to move on. Um, to merely surround this American village and win a place in the entering class has taken a lot of grit on your part, so yes, congrats to all. Uh, you may think that you've about got a maid amidst the impressive college buildings and company of a high-powered faculty surrounded by the best of your generation. All you need to do is keep doing what you've done. I'm going to put, okay. Makes sense. And then... Delete these. 
Um, listen to your teachers, get along with people around you. You'll emerge in four years as an educated young man or woman ready for life. And then in the next paragraph, he says, do not believe it. It is not true. Um, I'm going to put what right does he have to say this? Question mark. Right. So I'm going to put a feeling on here. Um, and I'm going to put that this is frustrating. Oops, but I'm going to spell it right. All right, so um, I'm stopping sharing. And this is going to be what you're going to be doing for that article, or for, excuse me, for that um, assignment. You're just going to be going back and forth. And what this is going to allow you to do is it's going to um, give you a chance to think about, like, like, how is it that you read? What happens and what point do you fade? That's really what I want you to look for, right? Like, like what are the kinds of things in the text that make you lose focus, lose interest? But I want you to hold yourself to the standard that you are going to, um, hold yourself to the standard that you're going to write something for each of the paragraphs, even if it's a word or two. And if it takes you, you know, a couple of different sessions to get through that whole, uh, that whole paragraph, that's fine. Uh, excuse me, that whole that whole text, that's fine. Um, what I really want to begin to communicate is the fact that even if parts of a text are frustrating or poorly worded or irrelevant or ridiculous, that even if parts of the text feel that way to us, that doesn't mean the text as a whole is a loss. And you know, we're not in an in-person class, right? So this is this is the best we get. Um, but if you're in an in-person class, so many times across college, you're given these big, long, complicated texts. And almost invariably, at the beginning of class, after being asked to read one of these texts, your professor says something like, well, what did everybody think about this text? And you're thinking back, and if you read it, you're like, I don't know, it's like this 25-page long dissertation on, you know, Aristotelian ethics or something. And so um, you don't necessarily know what to say. But that doesn't mean that you didn't have these thoughts while you were reading. And there's a lot of value in being able to say, like, there were a lot of parts of this that I didn't understand. Uh, there were some parts that made me really frustrated. I thought that uh, it was given from a single perspective. But I did think it was interesting in paragraph three when he said blank. Uh, this made me think of blank. And if you do that in an academic, in an academic setting, I mean, th there is nothing more you could ask for as an instructor than somebody who engages and questions the text in that way. So it's about so much of reading, so much about engaging in an academic context is about building these skill sets because it's so easy to look at the text like the one we're looking at this week and say like, oh, this is boring, it's not for me, this is ridiculous, I can't read this, I don't wanna read this, I don't agree with him, I think he has a bad perspective, I think it's myopic, I think it's written for a single audience, right? Like those are all things that are probably true um, and that might go through your head. But if we want to have an opportunity to voice our perspectives, it's important for us to understand what parts of other people's ideas and perspectives we agree and disagree with. So um, I'm going to cut myself off there because I'm trying to keep these under 15 minutes. Uh, so if you have questions about this, um, please feel free to bring them up on the discussion board or shoot me an email. To those of you that uh, who are emailing me regularly, I welcome those. That's wonderful. If you want to stop by, I'm in Gordon 202 in this office right here. Uh, it's in the Learning Center on the other side of the cafeteria. So if you want to just come meet me, uh, you want to pop by, please, please, by all means, I'm here 8.30 to 4.30 almost every day. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays are easier than Monday Wednesdays typically. I have fewer meetings, but um, by all means. I hope everybody's enjoying the class. If you have any questions, um, please let me know.